Um, so welcome everyone. It's been a uh, well, it's been a funny old week, hasn't it? With all of the announcements, you know, we went to we went to the rule of six, then then Liverpool went into into lockdown, and now um, there's been further changes, particularly for those who are trying to plan weddings. Those those changes have come into effect, and uh, I know Mark and Sarah are having to rearrange, and we're having to rearrange. But anyway, the the thing that we have as Christians is the light of the hope that we have in Christ. And no matter what problems come our way, we can always look up and seek him and seek encouragement from, from our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, which is why this is so good on a, on a Wednesday night, just to come together, you know, and at the end, just to, to break out into our little rooms and pray together and share sharing our lives together and ask for prayer so it's it's really good that we're doing this and we you know that we have this technology to be able to do it okay can everyone hear me okay yeah, it was brilliant oh that's good i uh, i got my posh introduction then thanks rob phil cornell it's a bit like the hyacinth bouquet um idea that's that's brilliant thank you um Right, in 1960, there was a race with a very famous outcome. It took place in Canada, and though there were eight athletes in the race, the victory was being contested by two great runners. The four minute mile was about to be broken, and the world expected John Landy or Roger Bannister to do it. John Landy had been leading for most of the race, and at times he had up to a five metre lead. And there was about 200 yards to go. They were coming round the last bend when John Landy looked behind to see where his opponent was placed. At that very moment, Roger Bannister passed him on the outside while he was looking on the inside. And John Landy lost the race. He'll go down in history as the runner who looked back. He should have been concerned with running his own race, but he lost focus, took his eyes off the finish line, and it cost him the race. There are a number of times in the Bible that the Christian life is likened to a race. Paul does it in Corinthians, Galatians, and Timothy. And today I'd like us to look at some verses from Hebrews. Um, but, and see what encouragement we can gain. In Hebrews chapter 12, the author of the letter says this, Therefore, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter, of our faith and we're going to look at it bit by bit and um, and it starts with this amazing statement therefore since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses i once heard a preacher say that when something starts with therefore we have to find out what it's there for and i think what he was saying is that it points to something before it authors of Classical literature used the image of a cloud to describe a large group of people. And the writer uses that picture here to refer back to the heroes of the faith listed in chapter 11, where we have a list of people throughout scripture whose faith has cost them greatly, but they understand what awaited them, what was worth the cost, and they inspire us. Here's a section of that chapter, chapter 11. And what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell you of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight, women received back their dead by resurrection, 
Some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, and they were killed with the sword. They went about in the skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains, and in dens and caves of the air. What's crucial for us here to understand is the word witnesses. A witness can observe something, like a, a car accident, and then report on what they've seen, an observer. But in this context, it seems that these witnesses are not observing us as we live our lives, um, but rather they are a witness to us of faith and endurance in all that they've lived and experienced. In this way, the great cloud of the faithful Christ followers through history offers us as Christians motivation in our current situation to stay the course. And someone called F.F. F. Bruce once said, it's not so much that they look at us as we look at them for encouragement. But in looking to them, we don't focus on them. They were all fallen human beings. We see God and we fix our eyes on him, the reason for their faith, the reason that they could have the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. As chapter 11 starts in verse one. It's certainly a challenge to me when I consider the question of how well I study and learn from the examples of those that have gone before. Then we have the next part. Therefore, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings to us so closely. It would look extremely strange, wouldn't it, if in an Olympic final all the athletes were lined up in their kit and there was an athlete out there wrapped up in heavy chains. It seemed ridiculous. Yet do we at times carry round with us the weight of guilt, anxiety, a harshness on ourselves and sin? In some translations, it says the sin which so easily ensnares us. And the word easily ensnares translates into a Greek word, which I, I can't pronounce, so I'm going to get it wrong. But it's something like eupristatum, which can be translated in four ways. Um, easily avoided, admired, ensnaring, and dangerous. Some sins can be easily avoided but are not. Some sins are admired and must be ignored. Some sins are ensnaring, which makes them especially harmful. And some sins are physically harmful and dangerous. What we must remember is that it's not in our own strength that we are to lay it all aside. It's through Christ's saving grace and the continual process of him making us more like him. When we look to him, he helps us to see more clearly who we are meant to be. And if we're laying everything at the foot of the cross, he gracefully accepts all our burdens and he clothes us in the kit we need to run the race well. As the song says, your majesty, I can but bow. I lay my all before you now. In royal robes I don't deserve, I live to serve your majesty. So we follow the witnesses of those that have gone before to turn our eyes to him. We throw off all that hinders us, but only by focusing on him and his will for our lives. And then the verses we're studying instruct us to run with endurance. <clears throat> the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. One of the gold medalists in the London Olympics in 2012 was Mo Farah. He won the 10,000 metres 
and the 5,000 metres. Two races with a combined distance of less than 10 miles, which still sounds quite a long way, doesn't it? Um, I looked at Mo Farah's training regime for the years leading up to the London Olympics, not weeks, not days, but years leading up to it. He ran 135 miles per week, going out twice a day on punishing training runs. He spent long periods of time away from his family, time and, and friends. When he ate, when he slept, everything was dedicated to one goal. He did it when no one was watching, in the dark, the cold and the rain. Why? So he could endure all that the race had for him. The verses in Hebrews tell us that we need to run with endurance. But what does that mean for us as Christians? Well, first of all, we need to understand that our ability to endure relies on our understanding that we can't do it in our own strength and that we shouldn't be trying to do it in our own strength. Our training is to immerse ourselves in God's word, which focuses us completely on him his character, his awesomeness, his holiness, his power, and his grace. Psalm chapter one, verse one to two says, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Our training is to spend time with God in prayer individually and corporately, which focuses us on his heart for his will, for his love for us and as his beloved children, and opens our eyes for his purposes. John Piper has said that praying before the throne of God and meditating on the word of God are like parallel rails that enable the train of our souls to stay on the track that leads to holiness and heaven. Our training makes us prepared to run with endurance, but not by enabling us to do it in our own strength, but to drag our eyes off ourselves and our own weaknesses and to help us focus on him. And it says the race is marked out for us. It's like the runners looking down the track at the course they must run. They know what they must go to, or where they must go to run the race successfully. As runners see the path lying before them, so do we. We might not know all that will happen between here and the finish line, but we know the God who made the universe has a purpose for each and every one of us. And we know what glory awaits. We look to Jesus, the founder and perfecter, of our faith. He's the beginning and the end. And unlike John Landy, the runner who looked back, we are to fix our eyes on him and we will run the race well. <laughs>